good. So, uh, next speaker is Matthew Roberts uh, from uh, Imperial College London or APSTP, and he gave up. He gave us talk about spindles and new Jericomato SCFTs. Would you please start? Great. Thank you. And uh, thank you. I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, I'm, of course, sad to not be there in person, but in roughly a month, I, I will be there since I'm uh, moving to the APCTP anyway. So I will get to see you eventually in person. So, yes, I'm going to be talking about um, spindles and some new uh, interesting SCFTs we found. This is based on work uh, I've done quite recently with a number of collaborators uh, around Europe, Igal Arav, Jerome Gauntlet, and Chris Rosen. So what, what is the idea? Uh, well, because there's this, uh, a, 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 at least to holographers, new ingredient that's been played with for the past maybe one or two years, spindles, I'm going to tell you what a spindle is, how we use them in holography, and then we'll go through an example, which is taking uh, the famous 4D n equals 1 Lee Strassler theory and wrapping it on a spindle. So here is Rob Lee, here is Matt Strassler, and here they are wrapped up on a spindle, which is the, the goal of this talk. Um, now, I'm going to be mostly talking about my recent work, but there's been in the past two years, there's been a fair amount of literature. Of, of various people working on uh, compactifications on spindles. This is a reasonably robust list, but I apologize if I've, if I've left someone out who, who should be on this list. Um, but what I'll be talking about today will be mostly based on this recent work of mine, as well as this paper uh, from maybe a few months ago that is a very nice review of a lot of these features. So they, uh, a reasonable starting point is just saying, what is a spindle? A spindle is, a, is a, a very nice mathematical object that you can kind of think of as something that is topologically a two-sphere, except it's not necessarily a round two-sphere. You might have conical deficits at the poles, right? So you can think of this as an orbifold in the sense that I can, in a differential geometry sense, I can think of it as locally being covered by patches, not of Rn, but of Rn quotiented by some discrete subgroup. But importantly, spindles are not necessarily what are usually thought of as good orbifolds in the sense of, if we think of you know, C mod Zk, we know that there is a covering space of C mod Zk, which is a nice smooth manifold. It's just the universal cover. But if I don't take commensurate deficit angles at the North and South Pole, there may just not be a good smooth cover of my spindle, but that's not a problem. Orbifolds only have to be locally defined uh, in terms of patches that look like Rn mod gamma. So there's in the math literature, there's a canonical example, which is just a generalization of uh, the complex projective space, a weighted complex projective space. So this is almost the usual definition of uh, CP, uh, uh, CP1 here, where I, I take two complex coordinates and I identify them up to rescalings, but I allow for different weighting between my coordinates Z1 and Z2. And it's important here that I'm going to essentially always assume that N plus and N minus are going to be co-prime and not equal. So if you think about this as a projective space pretty quickly, you can deduce that the poles of your two-dimensional manifold will occur when either Z1 or Z2 is zero. And as long as this integer N plus or N minus is not equal to one, at that pole, you have a conical defect and the periodicity is not two pi, but it's some fraction of two pi divided by this integer N. And it's important to point out that these spaces um, do not admit constant curvature metrics unless you restrict to the trivial case where n plus and n minus are both one, because that example is just a two sphere. But in general, there is no nice constant curvature metric on these spaces. Um, there's something more interesting. So here's a picture, if this is just zooming in. So here is a case. Uh, the weighted complex, complex uh, projective space 3, 1, 
the three is telling you that I have a conical defect at the North Pole, but one tells me that at the South Pole, I don't necessarily have a defect. Here's another example, three, two. Since neither of these is one, I have conical deficits at both poles. And this is just a nice plot of how you might embed this two-dimensional manifold in, in three space. But th this, is, this is maybe uh, in, a, in a topological sense, a, a very useful way of thinking about what these spaces look like, but we can generalize this when thinking about two-dimensional spindles. And it's really just a, a reasonable generalization of the metric we write down on a sphere all the time, right? I have some azimuthal angle theta and that, I, that lives on an interval. And then I have a circle phi and that size of that circle phi is a function of where I am in the azimuth, right? So if H is just sine theta, this is the usual two sphere, but I can put any function I want in here as long as it vanishes at the poles so that I have this nice degeneration. And the slope of this function at the poles determines precisely what I mean when I say there is a conical deficit, right? Because you could say, well, I take this, if the slope is non-trivial, well, then can't I just rescale theta? But I can't rescale theta because I fixed its periodicity. So this is the rough picture of what a spindle is. Here, I'm restricting to the case where I make them axisymmetric to make my life easier. Um, you can think of more general spindles, but for everything that I will talk about, I will be focusing on the axisymmetric case so that all of the non-trivial geometric structure is going to live in this function that tells you the size of your circle along the azimuth. Now, a very reasonable question to ask is, why are you telling me about these singular manifolds, right? They're not curvature singularities, but they do have conical singularities. And this should give us pause. Um, but we know from plenty of examples that sometimes conical singularities uh, and orbifold singularities in general are perfectly allowed in string theory, but we have to check and make sure when they are. Um, if they are okay, then that's great because we've discovered some new class of interesting uh, manifolds that we can imagine wrapping brains on and trying to come up with new interesting field theories that we would never find if we only considered smooth compactifications. But we have to answer this very, very important question, which is when can we trust these things in string theory? Right? And the answer is going to be that if this spindle uh, is can be can be interpreted as the base of some gauge bundle, and that gauge bundle plays nicely, then the total space of a gauge bundle over the spindle can in fact be regular. And that's a little bit surprising. So let's go through a, 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 a very simple example to see how this works. So S3, the three sphere, is, is very usefully thought of as often you can think of it as a two torus vibration over an interval where at the two ends of the interval the torus degenerate one of the two cycles degenerates on the torus when you think of it this way you can pick a particular uh, uh, basis cycles of cycles on the torus such that i can interpret my s3 as a u1 uh, gauge bundle over a round two sphere. So here I'm just schematically writing out what the metric looks like. And you see, this is just the metric on a nice round S3. And I write it as a base, that this is just a, a two sphere base. And here is new, my fiber direction with some non-trivial connection. So I can think of this nice round three sphere as well, everything is still smooth, right? I have a nice regular U1 gauge bundle over a round two sphere, but that's because I very particularly picked out the hop fiber circle as where I want to interpret my gauge bundle. And you could imagine, what if I just pick a different cycle on D2? Here I picked out a very particular one, but it's a torus and I can just isolate whatever cycle I want and see what happens. So let's again start with, again, the usual flat uh, metric on the round three sphere. And I'm going to pick some new torus basis 
labeled by some nice integers n plus and n minus that uh, should be very uh, compelling because as you can guess, these will be the n plus and the n minus of the spindle. This is a uh, actually somewhat boring exercise. You just plug this change of variables into this line element and you get some new non-trivial geometry. You find that uh, the metric again can be interpreted as a two-dimensional base with some non-trivial fiber bundle on top of it. Um, sorry, I should have included the fact that now when you look at this carefully, you'll find the slope of F at the poles is precisely of this form that at each pole, the value of uh, the derivative of F will have this one over N plus or one over N minus. And furthermore, you can calculate the flux of this bundle through the surface and you find that it's fractionally quantized. So, so what are we saying? I'm saying that I can write down a two-dimensional spindle, this conically singular manifold, and consider what looked like fractionally charged gauge bundles on top of it. And as long as they are fractionally quantized in the right way, this guarantees that I can write down this total manifold and see that at the, at the poles where this piece of the manifold looked singular, it turns out that the total space is completely fine and we're very happy. But this is a very particular example because this flux is, is exactly tuned to this value, but there's a more general story here. So the, this was a particular example of thinking about the three sphere as a circle bundle over a spindle. There is a more general story and the moral is essentially the following. If I have a spindle and I have a, a U1 bundle over it, as long as all of the gauge bundles are appropriately quantized in this following sense, so N plus and N minus are again, just the integers defining the conical deficits of the poles, as long as the what usually should normally be a integer quantized flux is now fractionally quantized. So P has to be an integer. So that this flux is fractional. This will lift to a total space that is regular. And that's great. Why is that great? Because when we do holography, we often have say five or four dimensional gravity theories that have gauge fields. But we know that what's happening there is that those gauge fields are coming from a kaluza klein reduction. And so built into our string theory construction is an explicit geometric interpretation of the total space of that bundle. That's just the 10 or 11 dimensional manifold. So the punchline of all of this analysis is that when you have what I might call good five dimensional sim spindles, in a lower dimensional supergravity, like a five dimensional supergravity, as long as all of your fluxes are appropriately quantized and you, you have to just be careful and check this, what you will find is that the 10 dimensional solution is in fact completely regular. So that's great because if you have some sort of a holographic system and the 10 dimensional manifold is completely regular, then you have no reasons to ever worry about any of these singularities. It's an artifact of thinking of your system in a dimensionally reduced point of view that you might have thought you'd had introduced singularities. But the total space, again, is just completely regular. So with this in mind, we have to say, well, what is the game that we want to play? We want to try to understand wrapping some non-trivial, strongly coupled field theories that we're going to model holographically wrapping them on a spindle. What does that mean? That means that if I have a system that is usually D-dimensional ADS, I want to look now for solutions that are of the form a lower dimensional anti distitter space times some spindle. And because I'm working in the realm of some nice gravity theories, there will be some U1 gauge fields and I will make sure the gauge fields are appropriately quantized on the spindle as well. Now, this already is a hard problem. So usually when we look for solutions of this form, we say sigma is maybe a, a Riemann surface or a sphere or something else that's nice and is at least locally maximally symmetric. So I don't have to worry about coordinate dependence on this internal manifold and everything reduces to simple um, problems 
But as we said here, one of the points of spindles is that they don't admit constant curvature metrics. And so when you say you're looking for these types of solutions, you will, in a calculational sense, be having to solve uh, differential equations that depend on at least an azimuth on this spindle. Now, this is a statement about looking for fixed points. You could say, could I not imagine having a higher dimensional anti de Sitter space where some of my boundary coordinates are wrapped on a spindle and finding an RG flow that flows down to this fixed point? But that's then a much harder problem because you have to solve partial differential equations. You will have the radial coordinate describing your RG flow along with at least an azimuthal coordinate on the spindle. So it is at minimum a two-dimensional PDE problem. And that's, at least for the time being, more work than we feel like doing. So for now, we are just going to ask the question of when do we have nice ADS cross spindle solutions? And this is the focus of a lot of those earlier papers I had in my list of references. They were looking at D3 brains, M2 brains, M5 brains, et cetera, wrapped on non-trivial spindles. And what this would correspond to is you take some maximally supersymmetric gauge theory, and I want to wrap it on a spindle and find a lower dimensional theory. But that maybe is concerning because it's a little too special because you're focusing on maximally supersymmetric theories. And so an important question is, is everything that was found there an accident of having tons and tons of supersymmetry? Or can this be thought of as a more general procedure? If you want to start with, say, a four-dimensional field theory that's not quite as supersymmetric, but you still have good holographic control over it, there's a very, very natural starting point, which is the n equals one four-dimensional uh, superconformal fixed point, which is the least Strassler fixed point. So for those of you who, who don't remember the details of what the least Strassler fixed point is, you can find it as an infrared fixed point of doing the following to the usual 40 n equals four super Yang mills. So if you think of n equals four in an n equals one language, you take that n equals four vector multiplet that makes up the whole theory and you decompose it and you see that it splits into three chiral multiplets to one vector multiplet. Now, I can then clearly preserving n equals one supersymmetry, I can add a mass to, for instance, one of the three chiral multiplets. And there's lots and lots of evidence, much of it holographic, that that will then flow to a new strongly coupled fixed point that's called the least Strassler fixed point because uh, in, in the days before ADS-CFT, Lee and Strassler conjectured the existence of these interesting strongly coupled fixed points. The, the renormalization group flow uh, when you consider the Lorentzian variant case, so I'm not wrapping things on spindles anymore. I'm just saying I want to take my four-dimensional theory, turn on this mass, and look at the RG flow. It's been studied very extensively in the holographic literature. Let me just point out this. One of the nice things you see is that if I start with n equals four super Yang mills, I calculate the A coefficient. It's n squared over four. If I calculate the A coefficient of this new Lee Strassler fixed point, you see that it has this other nice rational value and crucially it's less than the UV value as you would expect, right? So there's a very simple RG flow from the N equals four theory down to the N equals one theory. And the flow is nice and monotonic. So if what we want to try to study today is uh, the Lee Strassler fixed point wrapped on a spindle, what are the ingredients that we need? Well, I need to turn on this mass for a chiral multiplet, which means that I will have a complex scalar in my bulk theory that has dimension three, so that it's a fermion mass. And because of supersymmetry, along with it will come some uh, scalar fields that are boson masses. In the usual sense, that if I want to preserve supersymmetry and I turn on a fermion mass, I, I obviously better turn on the uh, appropriate boson mass as well. And to construct spindles holographically, I need gauge fields, right? That was the whole point that we started with is that if I want to have a spindle and I want to make sure that the total space is regular, I need to think of gauge fields living in an orbit bundle and see how this works. So these are the ingredients that we will need. We'll have some, some scalar fields, some gauge fields, and we'll, we'll start playing with it. 
I don't want to get too into the details. This is just taken from their paper that you can just explicitly work out what the theory is. But I just want to point out that we have all of the ingredients, right? Hidden in here is my charged scalar that's dimension three. Here are some scalars that are dimension two. Here are my U1 gauge fields. What I want to point out is that when I turn on a mass for one of these chiral multiplets, it is necessarily charged under one of at least some U1 in the maximal torus of SU4, the R symmetry group of the original theory. And so you'll have to keep track of the fact that the scalar field that you're turning on is indeed charged. And you can look at this Lagrangian, you can see that, well, in the UV, when I'm looking near the N equals four fixed point, I have these operators and they have dimensions uh, three and two, and these are conserved gauge fields, so they have dimension one. If I instead look at this theory and study it around this Lee Strassler fixed point, I get some interesting um, small, uh, I get some interesting new anomalous dimensions, and I see dimensions that look like one plus square root of seven, two plus square root of seven, three plus square root of seven. So this is a bulk theory that can tell me a whole host of things about the RG flow from n equals four Yang Mills to Lee Strassler. So what is the problem that we actually want to solve? Well, we want to look for spindles that are of the form ADS3 cross something. So you write down a metric that has some warped ADS3 and some spindle. It's a pretty straightforward game. And because I want to consider only axisymmetric spindles, I'm going to assume that everything only depends on this azimuthal coordinate. And then you just have the, the fun adventure of deriving BPS equations from supergravity. I'm not going to tell you the details of it. It's hidden in the appendix of our paper because it's just a, it, it's a, it's a, a calculation that you just have to grind through. What I want to point out is that it, when we have a solution, what will it be labeled by? It's going to be labeled by n plus and n minus the geometric data of the spindle here. And then because I had three U1 gauge fields, there will be three uh, appropriately fractionally quantized fluxes that are turned on. And as we said, because we're working with this particularly nice five dimensional supergravity, we know that as long as these fluxes are adequately quantized, when we lift to 10 dimensions, everything is totally regular. The one thing that I do have to mention is that because that complex scalar was charged, I want to make sure that the particular U1 gauge field that it is charged under does not carry any magnetic flux. Because if it was carrying magnetic flux, I wouldn't be able to easily turn that uh, scalar on over the spindle. It would be instead solving some, low, uh, some Landau level problem that would have non-trivial angular momentum. And this takes me away from the realm of nice static solutions. So I'm going to explicitly impose this constraint, mostly to make my life easier. I want, to, sorry, was there a question? No, okay. I, I want to emphasize that this assumption is an assumption, it is not a requirement. And a more careful analysis might tell us that we've missed things by allowing it. What we do need to make sure we include is that we include some non-trivial R charge flux. And then you go through this game of studying BPS equations. It's a bunch of coupled first order uh, ODEs. And it's the, the usual game if you just try to extract things. The one additional ingredient is the following. Because I want to find nice super conformal fixed points, I have to think about supersymmetry in the bulk. And making sure that I have a well-defined spinner gives us an additional requirement constraining my fluxes. It tells us that the R charge flux which we know has to be quantized, actually has to take this following form. It can either be in what is called the twist case, where up to signs, this flux is exactly the Euler character, or a new interesting version called the anti-twist, where it isn't. It's the difference of n plus and n minus. So this twist case is a type of compactification that people have been familiar with for a long time now. It's the usual story of I have a compact manifold and I need to cancel the spin connection on the manifold against some U1R gauge field. It's the usual topological twist. This other case 
that is just called the anti-twist because of the sign change here is really something different. It's not a topological twist where I then just immediately have coordinate constant spinners. It's something new and it's something that we only find when thinking about these systems holographically. It's not clear how it is constructed on the field theory side. But this is the additional constraint. So I had three fluxes. I, by fiat, impose one constraint on the fluxes. Regularity of the spinner gives me another constraint on the fluxes. And so I'm left with three integers. There's n plus, n minus, and then there's one additional linear combination of fluxes that's unfixed. And so then your homework is just staring at this set of really quite gnarly uh, coupled first order equations for a long time and you just extract what you can from them. It's a very nice story of studying ODEs that is in the paper. I'm not going to tell you about it right now. What I'm just going to tell you are what are our results because I think they're quite interesting. So this set of ODEs is not quite integrable but it's almost integrable in the following sense. I can't just exactly integrate the equations and write down a solution in closed form, but I can analytically extract almost all data. In particular, I can find relations for the fluxes, the central charge, et cetera. So point number one is that all of the spindles that we are able to find live in this anti-twist class. They're not the usual topological twist. And again, I want to emphasize what's happening here is that the R charge flux is really not up to signs the same as the Euler character of the spindle. So this is a, a really new type of dimensional reduction on non-trivial manifolds, right? It's not the usual topological twist we're familiar with. It's something new. And this requirement that it has to be anti-twist is special to the least Drassler case. In the more supersymmetric D3 and M2 stories, you can have both twists and anti-twists. As I said, when I have these constraints, these only one fixed flux is basically P1 minus P minus P2. You find that there are regular solutions for certain allowed values of these integers. And most surprisingly, even though we do not have an analytic solution, you can kind of wring enough out of your BPS equations to analytically calculate your two-dimensional central charge of your ADS3 geometry and it has this very nice rational form. This is the two-dimensional central charge of the Lee Strassler field theory compactified on a spindle. It's, it's really, at least to me, quite remarkable that we, we just were able to derive this directly from these bulk BPS equations. Let me make a couple of comments about it. First of all, the round two sphere case, that's the case where n plus and n minus are both one. This is excluded. Why is it excluded? Because the central charge is just zero. So there is no anti-twist compactification on a round two sphere. You only have anti-twist compactifications on spindles. Another thing with pointing out that I really don't have the time to talk about is that you can also calculate the two-dimensional uh, central charge via usual stories of C extremization. You take the four-dimensional anomaly polynomial, I dimensionally reduce it on a spindle and I do some C extremization. And when you do this calculation in a large N limit, you get exact agreement with this bulk solution. But it's worth pointing out that when you do this field theory calculation, you are free to do C extremization for both the twist and anti-twist classes. And from the point of view of C extremization, you don't see anything wrong with a twist class. It's only asking when is there a good bulk dual that you find that only the anti-twist case exists. Another thing is that, as I've said, there's earlier work that considers just D3 brains wrapped on the same spindle, with the same fluxes, which corresponds to not wrapping the less supersymmetric the Strassler fixed point but wrapping n equals four super yang mills on the spindle. And you go through that calculation and you get another nice rational expression for the central charge. And something that I want to emphasize is that when you do this, you explicitly see that this n equals four reduced central charge is indeed bigger than the least Strassler central charge. So there is some inheritance and you might hope that, ah, maybe I can take n equals four, wrap it on a spindle and then turn on some two-dimensional analog 
of the Lee Strassler mass deformation and construct an RG flow to this Lee Strassler spindle uh, CFT. But since I'm running out of time, let me let me wrap up. W what have we done? We've explicitly constructed a holographic dual of the n equals one Lee Strassler fixed point compactified on a spindle. Even though that spindle looks like it is a conically singular manifold, it is implicit in our construction that the uplift to 10 dimensions is e explicitly nice, smooth manifold. There's no conical singularities in the total space. And so from a string theory point of view, it is a completely acceptable ADS vacuum. And so once you allow yourself to think of things like spindles, you find that there's a huge new class of uh, 2D fixed points living out there. We find that these things only exist in this funny anti twist class where the flux and the Euler character are not equal, so they are not canceling. We find that this matches C extremization, and this is maybe a more technical point, but this is also nice because it's the first construction of spindles that are built with hypermultiplets. In the earlier works, everything is done with gravity and vector multiplets where you get a lot more mileage because everything comes with a conservation law. But there are a lot of open questions, right? I just told you that we found these new fixed points. So a very natural question is, what is the BPS spectrum? What, do, what are the dimensions of light, light operators for these fixed points? This is work in progress. We hope to have an answer soon. Um, we have these pairs of spindles where there's a, what you'd call a UV spindle, an IR spindle, with a usual inequality in the central charges. You might ask, can I construct explicit RG flows between these two by turning on the lower dimensional analog of the Lee Strassler deformation? Another open question is where are the asymptotically ADS5 solutions, right? It's a hard problem because you have to solve PDEs, but you can still posit it. But you're in trouble because of a, a, a pretty quick mathematical fact, which is that when you're looking at the anti-twist case, because in the anti-twist case, you no longer have this balancing of the flux the, of the R charge and the Euler character, these anti-twist spindles cannot be thought of as simple sections of a calabi yau And so it's actually, even though we have these very, very explicit bulk ADS3 constructions, it's not at all clear what the brain construction for the anti-twist spindle is, um, but uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Let's thanks Iker for a very for a very interesting talk. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, I I think it's uh, I think it's not okay. And thank you, Matthew. Thanks.